good evening, Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> Peter and I are in the States, in the United States. So it's morning. Actually, I'm in Mexico right now. Peter is outside of Washington. So it's dark for us, but it's an honor to be here. It's been a while since we've visited Hong Kong and China, and we hope to get back again. Um, we're going to do this in two parts. I'm going to start and then I'll hand over the presentation to Peter. Um, I guess, uh, as I'm told, um, if you have questions, just type them in. We're going to have plenty of time to deal with questions. Um, and then, of course, if we do run out of time or if anybody has a question after the seminar, it's very easy to reach us. Our emails, we'll post our emails before this is all over, but we are very easy to find. You just type our name anywhere in the Internet and it's pretty easy to find us. OK. Um, Again, an honor to be here. So I guess, William, let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen first. We're gonna to to take a small tour just through some studios um, that we've designed, some old ones and some new ones, just to make sure we all know what world we're in, but we will be spending most of our time on exactly what's on the screen here right now, um, a very new and exciting development in uh, analysis and prediction. Um, that's been uh, happening by our WSDG research team. Uh, more on that in a second. So um, just to remind everybody um, what our goal is, and uh, Peter coined these words a long time ago. They still stick with us, okay? Um, if you can't take the room out of the mix, you can't take the mix out of the room. And we're in an era where this has never been more important. I uh, it it just dawned on me if in anybody for anybody who's watched the Grammys recently or any kind of awards program, you know, and they open the envelope and the best record is and 15 people come up on the stage. So what does that mean? That means songs are recorded in multiple studios by multiple composers. And if we are ever in an era where we need rooms and mixes to translate uh, as accurately as possible, we are in that era. We're also in an era of small rooms. It does not mean we don't have large rooms, but we have thousands and thousands of small rooms. And as you'll quickly see, uh, small rooms become much more difficult to deal with than larger rooms. Um, more on that in a second. So um, anyway, we've come a long way. Okay, and just to remind everybody, none of this made any sense until about a hundred and some odd years ago, because without recording devices, there's no reason to even think about recording rooms. And let's fast forward to the fifties a while ago, but not that long ago. And look how, look at this typical room. It's sort of architecturally very uninteresting and it's probably acoustically very uninteresting as well. It, it need only sound as good as the delivery system that it's, that it's uh, preparing material for. <laughs> But amazingly enough, artists have pushed the windows of technology and architecture and acoustics. That's my, my belief. Um, I suspect the technology pushed the artists, the artists pushed the technology. Everybody knows who these people are and in what room they're in. And now we have thousands of rooms that are architecturally pleasing um, and acoustically very, very exciting. Um, but still with some deficiencies, as we'll discuss in a second. Okay, um, Peter and I, our paths have crossed for over 40 years. Um, I, I, I personally list Peter as, as one, of, one of my great colleagues in this field and also a personal friend. And um, it's very exciting that five years ago, we finally um, decided to really work together. Uh, and the one of the results of that work is exactly what we're gonna share with you in a few minutes. Okay, this is me about 53 years ago, building Re Electric Lady Studios. I was very fortunate to uh, have as my first project, a one of the original project studios. And we're in an era of project and personal studios. Um, for me, personally, I never knew anything but project and personal studios. Um, Jimmy's Hendrix Electric Lady Studio still exists. It's one of the great studios in New York or the world. And um, but it was conceived as a project studio, as a personal studio for one of the great artists of all times. Um, it hasn't, uh, he died of course, and didn't spend much time there. 
some great artists move in year after year. And this slide kind of shows you the studio 52 years ago and about two years ago. And parts of it have never changed. Um, the key, strangely enough, to this studio is not Jimmy's vibe in the walls or a river under the floor, which, by the way, there is a river under the floor, or a subway a few hundred meters away, which there is, by the way. The key to the studio is the ceiling, which somewhat accidentally, um, I mean, I'm only 22 years old, so most of it was an accident, um, is, turns out to be a giant membrane absorber. It is a low frequency absorber. And that's what gives Electric Lady Studios its, its unique uh, recording sound. And it is, it is discussing low frequencies, which we're about to do in a few minutes. And that's the root of what Peter and our team, and you'll meet them very quickly in, in, in our photos, um, set out to try to explore. Um, our explorations have taken us further, but low frequency control has always been the nemesis of, of uh, I believe, recording studio design and particularly small room recording studio design. Let's just smile a little bit and look at some other projects that we've done recently. Uh, all of these using our Niro software. And I'm just putting these up there to make sure everybody knows we're still building studios. There are plenty of studios to be built. Um, and there are plenty of studios to be built um, using uh, this software, which we use all the time now. This is our main design and analysis tool for our acoustic prediction. This is uh, Sony Studios in Los Angeles. This is Carter Burwell. He's the composer for the Coen Brothers uh, uh, Oscar nominee, his private personal immersive studio. Um, uh, more studios to share with you. This is a studio in China, China Film Studio, a little closer to home. Um, the, in um, UCC, one of the largest schools in South America. My, one of my favorites, which is a tiny little studio in an Airstream that we put into a second floor building for a school, a uh, famous community school in New York City. And we teach girls how to be uh, radio broadcasters. Um, doesn't get much smaller than this. Um, and VSL's gigantic uh, immersive studio in Vienna. Um, first time we were able to put speakers in glass. It took us a while to figure out how to do it. Uh, this is in Brazil. More projects. I like this slide because I believe this is what's going on in the world today. It's sort of line between studios, listening rooms, all in one studios, studios that all that are in the home. What is this, an office, a recording studio, listening room, a den, a family room? It's all of them, okay? And so the need to be able to have software to handle small environments, okay, that are not necessarily uh, consistent with our traditional recording studio design has never been more important. Um, this is in Italy, Miami, one of our first uh, Niro projects and maybe one of our largest studios just finished in the last year. This is Spotify's signature uh, uh, installation in Los Angeles. Have about 20 studios, a gigantic podcasting wing, over 16 rooms, um, from very large podcasting rooms to smaller ones. And then an overview that shows you some of the recording studios in this area of their gigantic facility. And we'll take a look at those in more detail now, all designed using the Niro software. There's a photo and another one and the money shot, so to speak. But who knows where studios are gonna take us? <laughs> Maybe in the future, they're gonna look like this or this or this, we're not sure. We'll see, we're excited, but under any event, um, our team uh, and our software to date, and it's still growing uh, each week, we add more features to it. Um, we'll be ready to handle any environment that's, that's being thrown to us and any kind of monitoring technology that's thrown to us. Anyway, let's return to 
our evening story, I, I thought it would be, we thought it would be good to sort of set the stage and make sure everybody realizes that what we're talking about, um, we are applying to recording studio design. Right now, our software is not available as software. We actually don't really have any intentions to become a software company. We're really a service company. We use it exclusively for WSDG's projects. However, we have a number of other acquisitions um, who are now using this software in their projects. And we uh, allow that to happen and provide that support service for them. Um, we, we don't feel that this is uh, losing a competitive edge. In fact, we take just the opposite uh, position. We're, we want the feedback. We're interested in, in, in the feedback from other acquisitions and we're interested in the test results. Um, as you'll see later, we have over a hundred projects now that have uh, used this software, about 20 to 30 that are built um, with very successful results. We'll take a look at three of those when we're all done. Um, so with that, I am going to let Peter, I believe actually you could just take over with this slide on in your computer, correct? Peter, you're on mute. You're on mute, so you have to unmute. And um, so right? this is the uh, this is the team. <clears throat> and um, Peter, why don't you switch to your computer? Okay. And then okay, maybe back up one. I think. Yeah. Unless that was the yeah. If you back up one, then the team will describe the team to you. All right. Having difficulty backing up. There we go. Okay, so uh, right. this is our team. Anyway, I'm introducing Peter, and Peter will introduce our team, just to, so that everybody knows how this all happened. This started out as really an educational research project inside WSDG, which is my firm for over 50 years. Um, and um, it then became a, an extended research uh, project by one of our interns, who then became one of our employees. That's Rinaldi. Over there to the right, he might even be listening in this talk. I'm not, it's hard to know if he's here, but hopefully he is. And um, it got so complicated and so uh, exhaustive that we just spun off and formed basically a development and research company. Peter, the master of acronyms, named it Research Education Development Initiative. And that's the history of Ready Acoustics, which then has gone on to create this software. Peter, I'm going to hand this over to you. All right, thanks, John. Um, so, um, just one moment, please. <clears throat> so scientists uh, typically use what are called boundary conditions when they're trying to solve problems. And in room acoustics, we essentially have two boundary conditions. We have an anechoic chamber and a reverberation chamber. Uh, what you're seeing are the uh, temporal responses. In uh, 1984, I was involved in designing a studio for the first time, kind of like John. And it occurred to me, or I wondered, um, how does one design a recording studio? And uh, so I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to combine both of these boundary conditions. And so to simulate the, what is called the initial time delay in a large room, <clears throat> I created uh, what I call the reflection free zone, in which the reflections are 15 to 30 dB down, uh, followed by a diffuse field zone using uh, reflection phase grading diffusers. Um, and this is sort of the basis of um, the program that we have developed. Um, okay, so John spoke about that already. and. Um, so the first thing we have to do is to minimize all forms of acoustic distortion, what I've called acoustic distortion many years ago. And below 200 Hertz, we're dealing with modal, modal issues and what I call the speaker boundary interference. Modal issues, as you know, are a result of the geometry of the room, the speaker and listener placement, and lack of low frequency absorption. The speaker boundary interference is simply a, the coherent interference of all of these speakers, both real and virtual. Uh, and then above 200 hertz, we have comb filtering, which is a coherent interference between sound and a delayed reflection. And we have pore diffusion, which uh, 
results from a non-mixing environment, too much absorption or poorly designed diffusers. And so to, uh, to deal with these, to simulate these, uh, both of these uh, frequency regions, in the low frequency region, we have to, re we have to use what are called wave-based uh, pressure solutions to solve the wave equation using complex admittances. And then <clears throat> above, uh, above 200 Hertz, we can use uh, geometrical acoustic solutions. These are energy-based models using absorption coefficients and scattering coefficients. And <clears throat> what we do in the Nero program to uh, simulate the low frequency response below what is called the Schroeder frequency, which is related to the reverberation time and the volume of the room, we use a finite element method uh, at the moment, we started with a boundary element method, as John, in for <clears throat> John uh, described. We are continually evolving uh, this software uh, uh, to, uh, and then above the shorter frequency, uh, we use geometrical acoustics. We use an image source model to um, evaluate the low order reflections, and then we use ray tracing. Uh, in order to calculate the reverberation time. <clears throat> the challenge involved here is that uh, we have to navigate, uh, we have to navigate this pressure field. For some reason, I'm, I'm having some difficulty here. There you go. We have to navigate uh, these pressures. Uh, you're seeing two views of, of the room with the with a boundary mesh. And we have to find the sweet spot uh, for a given geometry where the loudspeakers and the listeners uh, can be optimally located. And that is really the challenge. And so what is typically done to address our low frequencies is a, a geometrical acoustics approach uh, using dimensional ratios. Um, and you've seen these models. Uh, in a cuboid room, solution to the wave equation is very simple, as you see here. And we're using a, a common example of 1 to 1.4 to 1.9. The ceiling is usually the 1 and the width and the, and the length. And uh, so <clears throat> dimensional ratios uh, determine the location of the modes, not the energy of the modes. And so what we're going to go through now is an example of uh, comparison between uh, this simple dimensional ratio prediction and a, and a uh, finite element method calculation. Uh, because <clears throat> in this uh, simplified calculation, um, the room has to be cuboid, it has to be perfectly reflecting, and all the modes are excited and all the modes are, are heard, which uh, is a situation in which the speaker is in one corner and the listener is in the opposite diagonal corner. And so you can see that the, the location of the modes is really quite good in, uh, in a cuboid room. However, the energy uh, or the levels of these modes is, is not uh, quite as good. And then we can progress to add um, realistic boundary conditions with an admittance of 0.02. And you can see that the agreement uh, becomes e even worse. Uh, we can then get to an even more realistic condition where the loudspeaker is in the room at a certain location. Uh, and then finally, we place the loudspeaker and the listener in the room where the listener is typically in the middle of the room. And you, uh, you see that we have uh, the null due to the, the, uh, the null of the, from the width of the room. And so uh, in order to really uh, simulate the low frequencies, you really have to use a wave model. Uh, and <clears throat> that simplified um, calculation does not include the speaker boundary interference either, as I mentioned. And the speaker boundary interference results in a very serious uh, dip in the frequency response, which gets worse and worse as you add more boundaries. And uh, as you move the speaker to uh, the dihedral or the trihedral boundary in the ceiling, uh, you move that notch up higher in frequency. Uh, which is another reason to locate the loudspeaker in a boundary as opposed to freestanding. Now we'll discuss uh, the wave-based and geometrical acoustic models that we use in Nero. Uh, <clears throat> a, 
It uses complex surface admittances for boundaries and the acoustical treatment in the room. Simultaneously optimizes the location of the speakers, the listeners, and the room's vertices or the room's geometry of any shape room. We're not restricted to cuboid rooms, although we, we can model cuboid rooms. Uh, uses a wave-based finite element method to evaluate the low frequency response. And as I mentioned, the image source model and ray tracing uh, for uh, the higher frequencies. And then we combine these methods uh, using a multi-objective optimization, me meaning that we optimize a lot of variables at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can combine them uh, uh, into a um, impedant, uh, into a uh, impulse response with which we can then uh, oralize the room. And so um, <clears throat> this is an example of the flow chart. We start out with an optimization of the geometry, the sources and the receiver positions and the reflection free zone. Once we have that optimized empty room, we then add acoustical treatment and we evaluate all the possible variations of acoustical treatments, the types, the locations, uh, their effectiveness, their absorption coefficient. Um, and then we, <clears throat> we recalculate all of the various metrics that we minimize to uh, create the optimized solution. We then uh, combine those two models to create uh, an impulse response with which we can oralize the room. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you that may not be familiar with finite element method, finite element method is a wave-based approach in which we can simulate the scattering from the room's boundaries and any internal objects in the room. And it requires both a boundary element mesh, in other words, a mesh of the boundary, and also a mesh of the interior volume. <clears throat> and because of that, um, the larger the room, uh, the more uh, the more the, the more mesh elements we have, the more differential equations we have to solve, and it gets more and more comp complicated. So what we're going to go through now is a, a a list of all of the metrics or all of the uh, what are called objective measurements objective measurements uh, metrics that we want to um, uh, optimize. The first is the frequency response. We want to minimize the standard deviation of the frequency response at um, several positions in the room, typically at the mixed position, maybe at a producer location in the rear of the room. And we want to do this uh, <clears throat> using a spatial average. In other words, uh, the mixing engineer um, uh, does not have his head in a neck vise. He moves around, he or she moves around. And so we want to minimize the spatial variation, which is this uh, lighter blue color. Uh, <clears throat> this is an example of how this actually happens. Uh, we're going to go through the three metrics that we simultaneously optimize. The first <clears throat> is the low frequency uh, frequency response. And that is, <clears throat> we minimize the standard deviation of the frequency, a weighted sum of the frequency response and the speaker boundary interference, along with this spatial variation, as you see in the lighter color, along with uh, <clears throat> minimizing the number of first and second order reflections in the reflection free zone so that we minimize coloration. Now, in the reflection free zone, <clears throat> as we mentioned, Hey Peter, um, just a you might we might point out how many times we do this, in, for yes, a given this, uh, um, example. This optimization that you see running here that can happen hundreds, even more than a thousand times. Uh, it's basically an iterative approach uh, in which you're looking for what is mathematically called the global minimum. In other words, you'll find some local minimum, some solutions that might not be the uh, most optimal uh, until you continue until you convince yourself that you get to a certain um, <clears throat> a certain uh, minimum and then you scramble all of the uh, all of the metrics that you arrived at uh, and you continue that again until you convince yourself that you are actually at uh, the optimal solution or the global the global minimum geometric solution right yeah and um <laughs> And so what the goal is, so here's a, in fact, this is the first room that I ever measured. Uh, it has no acoustical treatment whatsoever. You see that you have interfering early reflections 
from the side walls, the floor and the ceiling. And you have a very sparse uh, <clears throat> collection of reflections uh, in this outer region after the arrival of the first reflection from the rear wall. The goal then was, or is, to minimize the reflections in the reflection-free zone so that you're, you're listening to the direct sound from the loudspeaker. You can perceive all the nuances, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> all the spectral and spatial nuances uh, and then the room uh, comes in after a certain period of time, and you have a very uh, a very uh, linear, or in this case, linear decay in, in dB uh, of the reflections from the room <clears throat> tightly, uh, tightly collected in time to provide you with an ambiance and envelopment um, and a feeling of immersion. And we monitor the level of the reflections in the in the reflection free zone. Uh, before and after treatment, and the goal is to uh, <clears throat> is to create a reflection-free zone in which uh, the reflections are attenuated by 15 to 30 dB over a broad bandwidth. Um, and we'll describe <clears throat> how difficult that is uh, to create uh, a reflection-free zone down into low frequencies. Typically, we go down to about 500 hertz. <clears throat> so. The result of having these reflections in the reflection-free zone, <clears throat> when they combine with the direct sound, results in what is called comb filtering. And it's called comb filtering because these notches uh, <clears throat> are similar to the teeth in a comb uh, when you're plotting on a linear frequency axis. And um, <clears throat> when the reflection is uh, at an at a equal level to the direct sound, uh, where the difference is zero dB, you see that these notches go down to infinity and they're very severe. As you start to uh, <clears throat> attenuate those uh, reflections, uh, you start to uh, minimize uh, the comb filtering. And this can happen in two ways. You could either reflect uh, the delayed reflection away from the listener, or you can absorb it. And in most cases, you want to do both. <clears throat> and to explain that, uh, <clears throat> This is a goniometer that I developed many years ago, which measures the, uh, the spatial scattering from a surface. In this case, we have a reflector uh, and a, 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 an arc a semicircle of microphones and a loudspeaker. And what I'm showing you here now is the polar response that is measured at different frequencies. And so here we have the sound arriving at 45 degrees in the specular direction which we derive from optics because the wavelength of, of light is so, so much smaller than it is in sound that almost everything in optics is, is specularly related. In sound, we have surfaces that are have extent. And so what you observe is that at, at a low frequency, um, what I'm showing you here is the frequency and the ratio of the width of, this, of the scattering element over the wavelength. And so <clears throat> at low frequencies, uh, when the, the panel is equal to the, uh, uh, equal to the width of, uh, the width of the panel is equal to the wavelength, you get scattering in all directions. And <clears throat> as, the, as the wavelength uh, gets smaller and smaller as you increase in frequency or as the panel width gets larger with respect to the wavelength, you see that a lot of the energy is now scattered away from the incident direction, and it's going into the specular direction. And so <clears throat> when, the, uh, when the panel is much larger, in this case, 14 times larger than the wavelength, you see that the energy, most of the, almost all of the energy is scattered in the specular direction. So you want to either scatter the energy away from the specular direction, or you want to absorb it. Here we have no absorption on the reflection. As we add absorption, and I'm showing you this because we're adding a low pass filter. So all of the energy above three kilohertz is absorbed. You see, we begin to uh, make an effect uh, minim uh, or reduce the comb filtering. As we continue to absorb lower and lower in frequency, we control those that comb filtering even more. So, so now how do we uh, <clears throat> optimize the diffuse field? Well, there are two psychoacoustical um, observations over the years. One indicates <clears throat> the level, the, the psychoacoustical impression of the 
uh, level of the reflection with respect to the direct sound as a function of the delay. And <clears throat> in order to create a, a, an ambiance or an envelopment, you'd like for those reflections to be within this spaciousness area. And that's <clears throat> literally minus 15 dB and, and above. Uh, to minimize the contribution of the reflections, you want those reflections to be 15 dB uh, below the direct sound and greater. And then uh, Yoshiando uh, <clears throat> did a very important piece of research indicating that not only is the level of the reflection important, but it's the direction that that reflection arrives at. And so in concert halls, you want the reflections to come in at uh, <clears throat> plus or minus uh, 55 degrees, which is indicated by this dip in the inner oral cross correlation. In small rooms, we are removing those frontal reflections. And so we are deriving our envelopment from the rear of the room. The diffuse sound scatters uniformly uh, over a broad frequency range. Uh, that sound hits the reflective rear walls and bounces toward the listening position, creating a sense of ambiance. So now we are mixing or listening in a room that has a lack of interfering reflections and a certain degree of ambiance. Now, this is something new that we have uh, created uh, collectively between Ready Acoustics and RPG. It, it is a, a virtual goniometer. Now, in the past, most of the uh, measurements for diffusing surfaces were created using a ground plane uh, goniometer that you saw earlier. Um, and what we have created now is a virtual goniometer, which use, uses a boundary element uh, simulation. We call this vir virtual goniometer Virgo. And we can do this now from a 3D CAD file. So this is a very important development in architectural acoustics because an architectural uh, acoustic design team uh, can, provi can provide us with a 3D CAD file and we can, uh, we can virtually simulate uh, how effectively that surface scatters sound. And we can do that if you have an extruded shape or a, th a shape, three-dimensional shape. What you're seeing here is the, is the polar response, the three-dimensional polar response from uh, from a, a surface, a, a two-dimensional primitive root surface uh, that I developed many years ago. And then you see here the diffusion coefficient and the diffusion coefficient for a reflector of similar size. Uh, we remove that scattering to get what we call a normalized diffusion coefficient. So that moves the design process ahead. Uh, you don't have to create physical prototypes to measure. So moving forward, the next objective measure is the reverberation time and the modal damping. Uh, in an untreated room, <clears throat> depending upon the situation, you can have certain frequencies that ring, uh, which uh, results in a, rever a reverberation time that might not be desirable. When you treat the room, uh, <clears throat> the goal is to obtain a uniformly decaying uh, time response and an acceptable reverberation time within the ISO uh, limits, uh, both in the low frequency region and in the higher frequency region. And then finally, um, uh, after acoustical treatment, we then uh, take this uh, response that we have done our best in the empty room to uh, flatten. Uh, we then, with the addition of acoustical treatment uh, of many types, uh, we can obtain this uh, this uh, uh, blue curve here, which is flatter. <clears throat> now, in order to do this calculation, we have to use, we can't use uh, absorption coefficients and scattering coefficients in the low frequency region. We have to use uh, complex impedance or the reciprocal, which is called the admittance. And uh, we have a program called the, excuse me, we can calculate the impedance with a transfer matrix uh, method, but then to assure ourselves that um, we're using products that actually perform the way they are intended, we create an actual product 
this is a large impedance tube uh, that I developed at RPG, which is a seven ton tube. Uh, it's two feet by two feet, 60 by 60 centimeters. We create the sample of interest. In this case, it's a Helmholtz resonator. Uh, we measure three impulse responses from which we can calculate uh, both the complex impedance and the absorption coefficient. Uh, for smaller samples, porous materials, smaller Helmholtz resonators, uh, we use a, a smaller tube, uh, which uh, can measure between 63 hertz and 4,000 hertz. Um, uh, and, um, and then to get um, absorption, random incidence absorption coefficients, if we uh, want to, we can use this large reverberation chamber uh, that I developed at RPG, which is at 285 cubic meters between 125 hertz and 5,000 hertz. So then finally, we have the untreated room, the treated room, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the temporal decay, the reverberation time. Just to, just to summarize, these are all the metrics that we, uh, we <clears throat> want to optimize. Reflection-free zone, the frequency response, the temporal decay, the reverberation time. And then <clears throat> this is a plot of all of the absorption coefficients of the various materials that we use. And we can use up to sometimes 14 materials uh, different materials with different acoustical uh, characteristics. Uh, <clears throat> we then combine the wave and the geometric model um, to create an impulse. Peter, just for interrupt for 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 one second, so that everybody doesn't get confused. It is true that we may have a large number of specific acoustic treatments in specific areas, and you'll see some examples of that. Um, and it could be as high as fourteen, but it it's really not 14 different materials. It could very often be only three different materials, but we may have a half a dozen different resonator hole spacing. Okay, so it's not, it's not quite as bizarre as four, one doesn't have to think in terms of finding 14 specific individual different acoustic events for 14 manufacturers, um, but our solutions are very specific and in very specific uh, areas of the rooms. Okay, just for clarification, we'll point that out in, in one of our examples. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> yeah, so then we can uh, we can oralize these rooms. I'm not going to play these oralizations because it, uh, you need to listen under more controlled conditions. <clears throat> and then uh, this was our first proof of concept. This was a a laboratory that we developed at WSDG from, from a storage room. Uh, <clears throat> it had CMU walls and gypsum plywood, gypsum boundaries. Um, and we compared uh, the results uh, between the Nero program and, and, the, and the measurement of the modal response here. And we convinced ourselves that we were on the right track and we continued to evolve the program. And uh, <clears throat> John is going to describe a few, um, few of the, the hundred rooms that we have uh, actually use this program for. And uh, the first one, I'll hand it over to John, was Abbott Road. Yeah, we thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, I realized that we, we moved through this very, very quickly. I see one or two questions popping up already. Um, we'll get to that question in a second. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question that was, that was, as a matter of fact, why don't we just do that now before we um, someone's asking, I'm not quite sure who, um, wouldn't FEM have a high computational cost? Have you considered boundary element method? Peter, I think this is a relatively easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, <clears throat> we started with the boundary element method. Started, with, yeah. <clears throat> and it, it can be somewhat faster, but the problem with the boundary element method is that it's very difficult <clears throat> to model elements that are within the room. And in, in almost all of these rooms, we use what are called hanging ceiling clouds. <clears throat> and um, we, have to, we have to incorporate those elements into the mesh. And so that's, that's a much easier task. Uh, in FEM, yeah. Correct way to do it in finite element method uh, <clears throat> than in the boundary element method. <clears throat> it is a bit longer, but... Um, it's more accurate in our case. Yeah, I mean, it does have a higher, quote, computational cost, but speed 
I mean, we're all looking for speed, but, um, you know, sometimes if, if a run might take lunch or even if it's going to take overnight, it doesn't really affect our, our work process. We, we don't have projects that need to have a computation in two minutes. Um, a gaming industry may be an example of something where that, where something has to happen instantaneously. So we don't, we're not in that universe. So yes, it does have a higher computational cost, but it, in reality, it doesn't really, doesn't really affect our, our workflow, but that's a really mm -hmm. good question. Thank you. So we're answering that live. Okay, great. Um, anyway, if you just go back two slides to the Peter, to the first time we actually tested this. And it is true, it was a storeroom in our, we, we just needed a room, um, hit that again. Mm -hmm. And we took a room and we basically, the room already had concrete walls and any other wall, we just put enough layers of plywood on it so that we had essentially a zero, near zero admittance, basically uh, close to infinitely stiff wall so we could kill the admittance coefficient and then ran Niro or Nero, depending on how you want to pronounce it, against the measurement. And I'll never forget uh, the first time. And I'm sure Peter had the same reaction when we looked at the results. It was I actually thought we were cheating. I said, wait a second, that's impossible. They can't really be that 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 simultaneous. They can't really be one really on top of another. And and yet it was. So this was our first moment when I guess we realized that this software was in fact going to work. Um, anyway, let's take a look at two examples of our projects um, and we could push forward to Abbott Road. So this was one of the first ones we did. And of course, oh, what a surprise. We chose a really difficult one. Um, this is the private personal studio of the director of, of Berkeley College of Music, uh, uh, production and engineering department, Rob Jasko, a very well-known engineer and educator. And this is his private studio. It's on the second floor of a garage building. And when COVID struck, he was no longer able to use the Berkeley studios and had to continue his professional work in, in his room, which of course did not have a particularly easy geometry. So we picked a really difficult one to start with. And you can see the kind of success that we had. Um, the dotted line is the prediction. The measurement is in the solid blue line, pretty close. And the upper right hand uh, image gives you an example of the, oh, half a dozen different kinds of treatments that we had. But basically the treatments were, were resonators, uh, resonators and some velocity absorbers, um, two kinds of, um, treatments, but a half a dozen, actually more specific solutions, each one attacking a very specific mode um, in a very specific location, which we would never have been able to get using, say, for instance, Sabine or any other um, uh, formula that uh, any other program that, that was on the market. And um, this was combined with a few architectural moments. I mean, we uh, what happens is that out of the report, out of the work, our ready report is delivered with exact specific locations. And then it goes back to the design team. And, and um, the design team then has to try to integrate them. Sometimes there are a few changes, modifications. After all, this takes place in real rooms with real doors, real beams, real air conditioning, um, real clients, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, it was pretty close. You can see that there's pretty good correlation between our ready report and the final solution, very handsome room. Um, and you can see that the results are, are, are quite satisfactory, even though the room was very, very complicated. Um, and then of course, there's always the last step, which we failed to mention, which is customized tuning, which is always going to take place in, in any room. All right, let's go to the next slide i guess peter yeah and this is our second example this is uh really a fantastic project this is the new uh it's our first studio in europe in paris not hardly our first studio in europe and it is for mix with the masters the uh, uh global education team that's for years 
been using Fabrique Studios out in the countryside, and this is their now flagship uh, studio in Paris proper, um, which is called Rue Boyer. That's the name of the street that the studio is on. And uh, just to give you an idea of the floor plan, very complicated room. Um, here's the same room shown with the section. We didn't have a very, very high ceiling to deal with. Another 3D view that kind of shows you. Um, and and um, in the program, if we go back to the section, Peter, just flip back one section. Um, and it was, it was discussed very briefly with Peter. In the first phase, the, 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 the narrow prediction path really has two big moments. The first is the geometric optimization. And in the geometric optimization, that's where hundreds and hundreds of iterations are, are run using the, uh, the genetic algorithm to finally get the optimized geometry, which could mean walls changing, or it could mean speaker locations changing, it could mean listening position changing, anything that has to do with geometry. And in that phase, into the software, um, which is in Python, we will tell the program, what can we change? Can we move a speaker? Can we move a listener position? Can we move a wall? Can we move a ceiling? Can we angle a ceiling? And all those variables are thrown into the software. There's no front end on it, which is, what, of course, right, why we don't want to really be in the software business. Um, but our team puts this information in, and then, and only then, is the optimization run. Here, we couldn't move too many walls. We could change the ceiling a little bit. We could move our position a little bit, but every every project has a geometric optimizing mode, even if we can't can hardly change everything. In this case, a lot of the room was in place already. Let's take a look at, let's move the slide forward. Um, and on top of that, there was a client that really had some very specific aesthetic uh, issues to deal with. We can advance the slide again. And there you go. So here's the room. Um, and it had a few unique issues. Uh, first was that it really sort of wanted an old school vintage look. This is a kind of design. Remember, every project that we're working on has a client. Um, I always have said to Peter, I said, well, if we could just do these projects without the clients, it would be a lot easier. But of course, we can't do the projects without the clients. And um, by the way, Victor and Maxime, uh, very, very uh, talented team that owns Mix with the Masters uh, uh, brand and also now owns, of course, Rue Boyer. And you can see in the upper right, again, a complex assortment of treatments, each color representing a different uh, acoustic solution. Again, usually either resonators or velocity absorbers. Well, and in this case, a very, very large diffuser, which is actually a diffractal, one of the largest we've ever done in the back of the room. Okay. Now, the room had another bizarre uh, uh, requirement. And if you can go back and plan, whoop, don't, don't, let's just go back before. Well, we gave it away. Okay. Go back and plan, and you will see number five, right? Uh, you, if you go to room number five, that's control room B. There are moments when they want the largest room, which is the main control room, to actually become the live room for control room B. You can see through it, through the windows into it. Why? Because that's just what they needed to happen. Sometimes they give uh, talks to 15 or 20 people and they want to use the room. So there was a requirement, okay, in this room, not only acoustically to behave like a live room, but also for the console to literally go down on an elevator in a, in a pit, in, into a pit. So the console really couldn't move much more than a, about 10 or 15 centimeters. Uh, and then wood planks cover it and the room can then become a live room. We thought it would be fun to show you. So not that often that we have a control room that needs to have a console completely disappear. And in the next slide, I think we will actually see that happen. Um, there it is coming up. Um, and that was no, <laughs> that was tricky to do, but it turned out to be an advantage because what, what we, that pit, when the console is up, we got to use the pit as an acoustic element. It's not the first time we've actually had some volumes below the floor. It's not often that you get to do that. Sometimes we've done it in the front of consoles 
there have been some volumes that we could capture. So it turned out to actually be uh, an acoustic asset for us. We go to the next slide. And um, so there's that same control room now being used as a live room. Okay. So um, that diffuser really comes in handy in the live room. Okay. And it's one of the reasons why we used uh, on the upper ceiling in the back, uh, instead of using resonators, we used ele diffuser elements, diffusers that actually work as resonators and diffusing elements. Um, the room had to sort of be a work as a live room, a little bit more reverberant, but also work as a, as a critical listening environment when the console comes up out of the floor. Um, this is a first for us. We've not, never had a large console go up and down on an elevator, but 53 years later, it's always good to be exploring. Um, I think we can push to the next slide. Um, good. If you will, I think that's, yeah. Let's go to the next slide. And here are our measurements. And as you can see, they track pretty nicely uh, again. And this is before fine tuning. Okay. And our temporal decay, very even, very nice response. This is a typical list of specifications. You can see, in this case, there were 17 different treatments, but really there are only two. There are, well, actually four. There are a whole bunch of resonators with holes, but the hole spacing and the depth are slightly different. There's a very, very big diffractal in the back, of course, okay? And then, of course, some traditional uh, velocity absorbers, acoustic panels, okay? So, again, but this, this is a very typical specification list that we give along with um, the diagram um, for the room. Um, okay. Um, and I, there's a simulation versus measurement for the impulse response in the, uh, in the reflection free zone, almost right on the money, no surprise there. And simulation versus measurement for the T30, again, very close. So as we end, and we'll get ready for any more questions, um, Ready Acoustics, we're a virtual company. We have six full-time people that are working. None of them are in the same location. And um, my guess is this year, we'll probably have to uh, hire another person um, uh, with the exception of me and my founding business partner, PK Pandy. Um, everybody is pretty knowledgeable in, in uh, Python. Uh, and um, of course, uh, theoretical acoustics. Peter is the, is the uh, lead researcher. Uh, Rinaldi is the um, lead acoustician. Uh, and um, we're the adventure, as Peter likes to end, uh, is just starting. I think that last slide, yeah, if you push forward. I just wanted to throw some more slide. Here. You can easily. Yeah, you can easily find us. Um, yeah. Just type just in Ready Acoustics or WST. Oh, Excuse okay, me. Peter, sorry. Uh, it's, I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention that uh, <clears throat> I spend quite a bit of time, um, as John does, in education. And I have a weekly, a weekly LinkedIn post, an educational weekly LinkedIn post that is uh, not commercially oriented, just purely educational and you can reach me there uh and um i don't know if we have this is just the beginning slide yes it is <laughs> it is yes just we do <clears throat> even though it's <laughs> even though it's 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 approaching three years and thousands and thousands of hours we consider it just the beginning as a team we meet every week and review our scheduling we split our time between uh, client work which results in the projects that you've seen and pure research. Um, lately, we've had a little bit more client work than, well, I wouldn't say than we want, but we, we're, we're, we're very busy. There's a lot of work um, to be done, but we're still growing. Um, 
we still have more work to do, always fine tuning the software, always uh, addressing increased and improved optimization, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so it is, it is just the beginning. We're easy to reach, type in any of our names, uh, to our website, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think we'll unshare, Peter, and um, so we can just see each other. If you press unshare, right? And um, right on time, an hour and five minutes, as we said, and we leave some time for some questions. Okay, and again, thank you for Thank you for, for having us and allowing us to show you what we've been doing for the last few years. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for your really fruitful speech. And um, now we're coming to our question and answer session. Um, uh, all our guests, if you've got any questions, yeah, you can type in the Q&A session yeah, and um, we will we'll arrange to um, I'll speak to give you an answer. Thank you. Let's see if I. We must have done a very good job because there were very few. <laughs> there, there were very, very, very few questions. It's a lot of material to cover in an hour. Um, and uh, it, 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 it is a new. I, I, I wouldn't say new, but it is a. Is a very different approach to really accurately dealing with rooms. What's interesting is this this started out as an exploration in low frequency analysis. We've always had in our office a kind of moment where we tackle LFA, low frequency analysis. It's actually a phase of the project. And we were using all kinds of tools from intuition to very good guessing to uh, using software such as Bastion um uh it, and um even using traditional axial modal calculations to at least make a stab at room ratios etc cetera, etc cetera. so this project started out as a way to improve on that it first started out as a as a um as an intern project where we proved that a lot of what we were doing was really not accurate Okay, um, we did a study to compare non rectangular rooms with rectangular rooms. We were getting results from Bastion in rectangular rooms, but as the rooms become non rectangular, when, when at what point does a non rectangular room no longer work as you rectangularize it? You can obviously get an average XYZ for any non rectangular room, and that was an interesting study that we did. And it turned out that to, to, it doesn't take much before the non-rectangular rooms just completely fall apart in our calculations. And for a wide variety of reasons, we have a lot of non-rectangular rooms. Actually, most of our rooms are non-rectangular, um, but not for low frequency control. They're really, not, they're really non-rectangular either for aesthetic reasons, architectural reasons, or first reflection reasons. So that's where all this started. I don't think any of us realized the path. Hey John, I, I saw that two questions yeah. in Q&A box. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay, go to the question. So, so first question, what is the most challenging studio you've treated and what were the problems you encountered and how did you solve it? Um, well, there's no doubt about it that that first one we showed you was challenging. I, it, it should have not really been our first project. <laughs> it took a long time to get the geometry introduced. Um, into it and um, and you saw how we solved it. Um, we're on one now with a completely circular ceiling. The, the, the whole ceiling is, is a bunch of, is, is this family of circles that just change in geometry. And that's, that's causing a little bit of headache <laughs> with, with the ready team because modeling it is very complicated. Um, and then I think the next, Peter, you can chime in if you want. I think the next level of difficulties is when we cannot get good
good admittance information. By that, I mean the characteristic of the container of the shell, because it turns out that the admittance of the boundary is very, very important in our calculation. So sometimes we have that information, but sometimes we don't have that information. We're taking some guesses at it. And so there's some difficulty there. Um, getting yeah, accurate admit. Yeah. Peter, you can talk about that because we're, there's a whole nother project we're paralleling, which is how to get good admittance values. Yeah, I mean, typically, <clears throat> you know, there are there are several companies at the National Research Council in Canada being one where they measure the <clears throat> the STC or the transmission coefficient for various boundary constructions. And uh, <clears throat> what we are trying to do now is to set up a program in which, in addition to measuring uh, <clears throat> the STC, uh, we also measure the complex admittance. <clears throat> and this um, has become potentially possible using a portable <clears throat> a portable impedance tube, which you can uh, uh, attach to a boundary and, and determine uh, the yeah. complex admittance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're excited about that. And um, we're just in the initial stages of that research uh, problem. Yeah. One of the earlier things we, we found out was that the admittance is a huge factor in the calculation. And um, so knowing that either as we're, I mean, if we're designing a project from scratch and we're calling out the boundaries, then we can, we can know that admittance. But if we're inheriting a room with boundaries that might not be known to us, or even if they're known to us, we may not be sure how they were built. This can throw some of our calculations off. So that's a that's a challenge. We're we're accepting that challenge. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered. So um, and then what is your next target to achieve? <laughs> well, we just talked about one of them, <laughs> better admittances. Um, I'll let Peter throw out one and I'll throw out one. Maybe we'll throw out the same one. <laughs> we do well, have targets. Um, <clears throat> as we as we evolve from the boundary element to the finite element, uh, <clears throat> both, of those, both of those models are frequency-based. In other words, you do the calculation uh, each frequency at a time. There are other, <clears throat> there are other models, um, which are wave-based models, which are calculated in time domain. So for example, you calculate the impulse response from which you can generate all the frequencies. So that's one direction to go into. Um, and there, there are two two approaches for that: F time, finite difference time delay, and also uh, <clears throat> a DGFEM, discontinuous galeric um, uh, FEM. That's one direction to possibly head because you can get wave front propagations uh, and a lot of other things. Um, and um, the other is to um, optimizing the geometry of the room. <clears throat> has a limited number of <clears throat> degrees of freedom or a lim limited number of variables. Uh, you know, you have your vertices, your positions, your, uh, last speakers and listen, and that's a very definable task. <clears throat> when it comes to optimizing uh, the, um, the location, the type, and the area of an acoustical treatment, treatment. Uh, <clears throat> in that case, you have thousands Thousands of variables. <laughs> and so what we do now is <clears throat> we have an algorithm to generate all possible variables, um, all possible solutions, uh, which could be up to a thousand. And so, you know, while, <clears throat> you know, it's not physically possible, although you can scour a thousand uh, possibilities, uh, it would be nice to eventually um, iteratively optimize that, and that's in the works. It's, yeah. it's an humongous problem. I mean, right now, we we mm -hmm. literally, manually, let's just say there's three or four hundred little graphs. We'll look at three or four hundred. Now, that sounds overwhelming, but I, in fact, I was, when I first heard that, I said, well, how do we, how does somebody do that? But you, you, you'd be surprised. You can look at them very quickly, because all of a sudden, you'll see rows and rows. It's not getting better. It's getting worse, et cetera, et cetera. And you sooner or later can can zoom in on the on the one that's the optimized one, and then 
that reveals each each one of those little snapshots is is associated with a family of treatments. Yeah, um, the other thing to but add it would, to that, John, yeah, if I, if I could It would be nice in. if we could do that automatically. It would be nice. <laughs> yeah, the other, the other thing uh, that I, <clears throat> John and I have been doing this for decades upon decades, but <clears throat> I've learned an awful lot in doing this. What you learn is that, you know, if you use your intuition, you can say, well, let me put this, uh, this type of absorption in this location. Yeah. And it might improve the frequency response, but it might have a negative effect on the temporal decay or, or a negative effect on some other parameter that we're trying to optimize. Yeah. They're all interrelated. They're all correlated, <laughs> which makes it, it, which makes yeah. it so difficult. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, we've had to, um, there have been some, there have been some moments where we have to throw out intuition and history. I mean, all of us, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this for 52 years. Peter's doing this for over 50 years. And <clears throat> the other members of our team, not to mention the designers, we might have 500 to 1,000 years of studio designing. We're not the only ones with that kind of track record. And you bring to that a certain intuition. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you see the output of this. And it's, wait a second, that's, that's just really counterintuitive. So that's been a little bit of a surprise. <laughs> anyway, let me knock off another question here. How long does it take to simulate a small room? It's a few days by the time you add it all up, okay? It, it, you, in and out, it's a few days. I mean, it's not 72 hours of computer time, but, but it, in reality, it's gonna take a little bit more because what happens is the geometric optimization, which is much more automatic, happens, and then that goes back to the design team. And now the design is locked in. And it could be a month before the ready team sees the project again because we have real clients with real budgets and everything else that goes on in a project so we're in in our uh, workflow we're uh, constantly looking at geometric optimization then that project disappears then it comes back and we start putting in treatments a lot of times the designers the design team will start putting in theoretical holders for treatments like locations where we want treatments or, or locations where we can have treatments in the case of duct work so it takes probably a few man days by the time you're all done but in reality it could take a month depending on the flow of the project um these are real projects and we're real designers we're i mean we're working in a theoretical we're working highly theoretically, but we're handling real projects, real clients, real budgets, real pressures, uh, et cetera. Um, the, would this methodology be applicable for larger rooms? I'll let Peter tackle that. That's a very interesting question. Well, <clears throat> as we saw from the, uh, <clears throat> from the FEM mesh, um, <clears throat> you know, the larger the room, the larger the room is, the more mesh elements you need. And consequently, <laughs> the computation time becomes almost undoable. The other, and the other reason for not <laughs> using this in a larger room is that the shorter frequency is at a much lower frequency in a larger room. And so the modal issues are, are not as severe. And geometrical acoustics, uh, for which there are, are many programs, uh, does a pretty good job yeah. in a larger room. Uh, and, and yeah, that's the question. real reason. I mean, like Carnegie Hall, the shorter frequency is 30 something. It's, it's very low. Yeah, very low. This, this last question here is, uh, if this is referring to the Virgo program, um, this is something that, <clears throat> that I've been trying to do for decades. That is to make it, uh, what the question uh, asked was, let's say you, you have a product for which a manufacturer not all manufacturers, um, not saying this in a disparaging way, but not all manufacturers uh, are able to calculate uh, <clears throat> the diffusion and scattering coefficients of their products. Uh, however, now with the virtual goniometer, um, let's say you have a, a, a design team and they're designing a certain project and the architect wants to see a sine wave and, and the acoustician says, well, you know, that sine wave might be okay uh, <clears throat> for the aesthetics, but doesn't do very well for the acoustics. We can evaluate it very quickly just from a CAD model. 
uh, that moves the design process uh, forward so quickly because to create a, either a scale model or a full scale prototype, then have it tested uh, <clears throat> on the RPG goniometer, that, that takes a lot of time and money. So in, in my view, it's, uh, it's something I've been wanting to do and uh, we now have it and, and, and it's, it's very powerful. It's all cloud-based. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's all uh, it's all parallelized. We use thousands and thousands of elements, um, uh, terabytes, multiple ter tens of terabytes of memory, uh, in 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 a very quick calculation. Anyway, thanks for the question. I think we have exhausted the questions. <laughs> I well, there it's it's open, and we even finished with ten minutes to go. Um, William and the team, thank you so much for for letting us visit Hong Kong. Sun is coming up in the East Coast here of the North, of North America. Uh, my weather is, I think my weather is better than yours, Peter. It doesn't look good there in the Northeast. Yeah, it's not so bad now. Spring is oh. the best, best area to be on the East Coast in the spring. Yeah, <laughs> spring is almost here. We get some snow in New York, but it's almost here. But our colleagues are in Brazil and they're all, <clears throat> they're all swimming and going to the beach like John does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I remind you, we're very easy to get. Just type in Ready Acoustics, um, type in WSDG. You could type in our names. And um, if anybody has some further thoughts after digesting this, um, we're, we are, that's why we do this, really, is to, is to get, get more information and more feedback from everybody. So, William and team, thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Right, everybody. Bye bye. Okay, everybody. Thank good you. good thank evening. You. Good evening in Hong Kong. Participants. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks for Thanks. your time. Welcome. Oh, here's a question, though. They, uh, they're asking, I see a final question here. Will the presentation be uploaded? And um, I was asking, how, do, how will you be putting this somewhere so people can view it again? Maybe in a Dropbox or somewhere. Are you going to be doing that? Can you answer the questions then? Yeah, I think um, it would be possible. But uh, upon we yeah. get the consent from Peter and John, and and if you uh, yes. you, you uh, got your consent to share this information, we are we are able to. Um, no, 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 no. We uh, we're instantly giving you the consent. In fact, we want it posted so that we can use it again. Yes, yeah, so okay. we, can, we can arrange it. Yes. Yep. Good. It's a, Thank it's you, a verbal consent right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.